uh, our presenter, Kia Ellis. And Kia is a senior specialized solutions group curriculum specialist for McGraw-Hill Education. Uh, Ms. Ellis has worked with schools and administrators across the country to manage implementations and support teachers as they improve student achievement. Uh, Kia has presented at many regional and national conferences, including the Association for Direct Instruction Conference with NIFTI, NCTM, and IRA. And Ms. Ellis was an elementary and a middle school teacher uh, where she implemented many direct instruction programs. Kia completed her undergraduate studies in elementary education from the University of Florida and a master's degree in education with an emphasis on reading and an additional master's, master's degree in educational leadership. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kia. Thank you, Kia. And thank you Lindsay. all for joining. Thanks, Lindsay. And everyone, welcome to our webinar. Today we're going to be concentrating on assuring mastery with reading mastery. On today's webinar, we're going to cover the following things. We're going to look at Reading Mastery's program design and how it's actually designed to have mastery for every student and allow every student to be successful. We'll take a look at the cycle of mastery, how this looks in the classroom, and what that means for you as instructors. And finally, we'll take a look at what does mastery look like in the classroom? What should I be looking for? What should I see to know that my students are at mastery with Reading Mastery? Often when I go to trainings and I meet with teachers and administrators, they're asking me, how can you really achieve this mastery? Well, we achieve it one step at a time. Reading Mastery is a program that has a unique design that allows for every student to be at a mastery level. Because students tell us where they are by the placement test, and we start them right at their instructional level. So right away on Lesson 1, students come with some knowledge, and we spend that Lesson 1 reviewing and teaching and teaching to mastery. And that means for us 100% by the end of the lesson. The very next day, students take that information and carry it over with them. But here is the unique piece of reading mastery. We now introduce a very small amount of new information represented by the light blue area. This amount is between 10 to 15% on a daily basis. This allows for students to actually be able to manage this new information because it's not overwhelming and it's controlled so students can be successful. The very next day, they carry over what they've learned from lessons one and two, including that new information, and then we again add a small amount of new information, 10 to 15 percent for the student. This happens on a daily basis, and as you can see, as students move through the lessons of reading mastery, they're actually mastering things one step at a time by having that small amount of new information on a daily basis and making sure that every day we're teaching to that mastery level of 100% by the end of the lesson. Now you may be wondering, well, what happens if this doesn't happen, if mastery is not met? And this is where we really want to focus in on making sure we're teaching to mastery because we want students to be successful and the program is designed for that way. Let's take the scenario, same scenario, we start at lesson one, but let's just say this time instead of my students mastering 100% by the end of the lesson, they only master 70%. That new information is then introduced. They go to the next lesson without having mastered 100% and look what happens over periods of time. In this five lesson span, as you can see, the light blue area is large. That's a lot of information and becomes unmanageable. But not only is that light blue area large, just imagine all the things they came with that they still didn't master on a daily basis. So now they have to master things that they didn't master before, as well as new information, making this really overwhelming for students and making them frustrated, not only for the students, but also for you as instructors and administrators. Reading Mastery's program design is designed for every student to be at mastery. When we teach the mastery, we see that on a daily basis. The cycle of mastery happens every day on Reading Mastery at all levels. And while this is happening, we are constantly monitoring student performance. That is ongoing. The cycle of mastery will happen at every level and for all the skills, and it's a continuum. So let's just start with when we first introduce a skill in Reading Mastery. Next, we model the skill through the presentation book, through the lessons you have there. And then students get the opportunity to practice as a group so they can feel supported. This next step in the cycle of mastery, repeat until firm, is crucial. And we'll spend some more time talking about this a little bit later. But the repeat until firm is when the teacher, you, the instructor, is making sure the students are firm on the skill before they move to the next phase of the cycle of mastery. Next is individual practice. Now that students have practiced as a group, 
is an opportunity now for us to look at them as individuals and we give them individual practice. They continue to practice this skill and then eventually they will apply this skill. While this is going on, we are constantly monitoring student progress on a daily basis. This cycle of mastery happens all the time and you'll see that throughout all levels of reading mastery. One of the things that's important is what does mastery look like? I get this question a lot when you're going to classrooms or if you're a coach and an administrator, what should you be looking for? Well, group response is a huge part of what mastery looks like in a, in a classroom setting. But before we talk about it, let's take a poll and launch the poll about group response. And this is what I want you to think about. When your students are responding to something that you first introduce, a skill is new to them, what percentage should you see them responding? And then the poll, you should see the poll, and we'll get a chance to see what you uh, think. Right, so the question is, after students are taught a task the first time, what percentage of mastery should you see? So go ahead and click on your response, 50, 60, 70, 80, or 90 percent, and we'll go ahead and wait for the results here. Looks like everyone's answering. So on the first try, it looks like the majority of the group thinks 90 percent, and we also had a few folks who think 22% um, said 70%. Okay. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. When we look at a group response, when a skill is first introduced, a good group response it has to be on signal. It has to be academically correct. When my students are introduced to a skill the very first time, I'm looking for a group response of about 70%. So I know we had a big percentage of the audience saying, you know, 90%. 70% because it's brand new. It's something they haven't had experience with. As they gain more experience with this skill, if you are asking them a response for a skill that they've already had in previous lesson, you should see that percentage rise, and it should be approximately 90%. So when you're asking students the question, the group response should be on signal, academically correct, at 90% from previously taught skills. And then by the end of lessons, we are virtually looking at 100% mastery. And one of the reasons why 90% um, or 100% wouldn't be mastery, if the students answer 90% correct the very first time a new skill is introduced, then they, it's too easy for them. They already know it. So we know that we have to do some instructing if they answer at 70%. So think about that and look for that when you are uh, having group response. What part of your students are responding the very first time you answer, uh, introduce a skill? It should be approximately 90%, 70%. One of the things that is important in assuring mastery for students um, is repeat until firm. And we saw that in the cycle of mastery. It's a very crucial phase because this allows us to know if students know it. Let's take a look at the first example. The repeat until firm is going to be located in your presentation books. It's going to be at the end of an exercise or a task, and it's going to be in parentheses. This repeat until firm lets me know that I should go back and repeat if my students did not answer as a group response on signal, academic correct, at 70% this was a new skill, or 90% if it was a, from a previous skill. The repeat until firm lets me know that they have it and I'm teaching at a mastery level, and that's really what we want for a reading mastery. In this example from grade one, we can see that students are going to be sounding out a word. This is just one word, but if my students were not firm, I would go back and repeat steps A and step B. At the same time, you may be doing repeat until firm with longer exercises. In this example, you'll see students are asked to repeat the column until firm. So they have a column of words that should be read, and if they are on signal, academically correct, and this is a previously skill, it should be 90% of my group is firm, I repeat until I get 90%, and then I move on to my next exercise. Um, that is what repeat until firm looks like in the classroom, and is a crucial step in the cycle of mastery, making sure every student is at mastery. What you may also see in your repeat until firm and in your later levels of reading mastery are bracketed exercise. This that you're looking on the screen is a piece from a long exercise. And so when exercises are long, you often see brackets to sort of break up the repeat until firm steps into baby steps. Let's take a look at the first repeat until firm. This repeat until firm happens after I've asked my students to say a sentence. If they are not firm, I would just go back to the top of that bracket and repeat because it's crucial that they're firm on the sentence before they move on in the exercise. Once they're firm there, then I go ahead and go to my step F. 
there's another repeat until firm. If my students are not firm, let's just say this is a new skill and not 70% of my students answered, I would go back to the top of F and ask those questions again. Remember, the repeat until firm is crucial, especially in these bracket exercises, because these exercises are lengthy and long. And so we break them up, and we have multiple repeat until firm steps, making them sort of baby steps along the way. Repeat until firm, we'll see every single day, and it's crucial that the students are firm before you move on to the next exercise. But this does not just go for reading words, reading columns of words. It also is about the comprehension questions. At all levels, students will read stories and we'll ask them comprehension questions. And teachers ask me, well, should I go back and repeat? Yes. If they are not firm on comprehension questions, we want to go back and repeat. Comprehension is just as important as anything in reading, and we want to make sure that students are firm on these comprehension questions. In this example, you see where we'll read a portion of the selection and ask some questions. Let's just say my students were not firm on the first question here that you see with the arrow. One thing that you can do is that you can write down this question, mark it in your presentation book, and then come back to it before you finish the selection or before you finish the lesson. It's a great way to make sure students are firm on these comprehension questions. So the next time you're doing a story and your students are not firm on a question, go ahead and jot it down and then come back to it and repeat until they're firm and remembering those percentages. 70% for brand new information, 90% for previously taught information, and then 100% mastery by the end of lessons. Another way that, to make sure that students are firm is individual turns. You'll see these in your presentation books throughout all levels. I love individual turns because it's a chance to do a quick check on students. It comes at the end of an exercise or task, and what's important is to pose the question first and then the student's name. This way, all my students have to be ready to answer the question. And then if a student makes some mistakes, which may happen, you're going to go ahead and use the correction procedure that we talked about in our first webinar. Go ahead and correct as an individual, unless it's a short answer and you feel a group correction would be appropriate. Let's take a look at where you can see these individual turns. The individual turns are also in parentheses and typically at the very end of an exercise. In this task, I'm asking individual students to repeat two or more sounds. But you may also ask them to read a word. Let me ask you another question. Let's launch the question about individual turns. This time, I want you to think about what percentage of your group do you need to ask on individual turns? Now remember, you have multiple individual turns throughout the lesson. Great. So the question is, what percentage of your groups should get individual turns? 25, 50, 75, or 100 percent? We'll go ahead and you can click your answer on screen there. And we have the majority of the group thinks 100 percent, and then we have 24 percent of the attendees believe uh, a quarter of the percentage of groups should get individual turns. Thank you, Lindsay. So what we really want to try here in individual turns is to really ask about 25% of our group, and I'll tell you why. Now, this is an example of one individual turn out of a, one lesson. There's a multiple of these in this lesson, and if I had to ask 100% of my students for every individual turn, I would actually have a very lengthy lesson, and we wouldn't be able to actually get the lesson done in a lot amount of time. So you really want to try and do 25% of your group, and really making sure that you're calling on those lowest performers the most often so they could get multiple turns throughout the lesson. And then by the end of the lesson, you, you should have hit every single person. So 25% of your group on each individual turns because they happen multiple times in one lesson. Now you'll also see individual turns where students will have to read longer pieces of things. Like for instance, in this example, they have to read three words um, when they're reading their column work. So individual turns happens at the end of an exercise, it's in parentheses, 25% of your group making sure that you're hitting those lower performers first, and then making sure you're hitting just about everybody by the end of the lesson for um, individual turns. Individual turns is another way to check to make sure that everyone's at mastery. Remember, it's a quick check, that's why we only do 25% of our group. Let's talk about how we monitor progress, because we couldn't talk about assuring mastery without looking at progress with students. 
Remember the cycle of mastery where we're monitoring performance daily all the time. We also have other assessments to monitor performance, and that would be mastery tests, curriculum-based assessments, and fluency checks. Mastery tests happens in levels K, 2, and 3, and they'll be in your presentation book. Your curriculum-based assessments are in another teacher resource that I'll speak about in a, in a minute, and then you have fluency checks. Let's take a look at where your mastery tests are located so you can see how to find them quickly. In levels K, 2, and 3, they're going to be located in your presentation book. And in your presentation book, you'll get an example of what they look like. Here's an example from level K. It's right in the presentation book, and you can see it labels tests. It's, not, it's very easy to see as you're going through your lessons on a daily basis. It will be right in your presentation book. You'll see the directions for the, presentation, uh, for the mastery test and the actual mastery test. You also may see it in your planning pages, just as where um, it's going to fall in your week's uh, planning. So you'll also see it labeled in your planning page as well. So mastery tests are very important because they actually test longer or more information than just our monitoring our performance on a daily basis. So that's a very important piece for monitoring progress for your students. The curriculum-based assessments are also a crucial piece. They're at every single level. And in levels K, 1, 2, and 3, they're every 20 lessons. And at levels 4 and 5, they're every 10 lessons. In every kit that you receive for Reading Mastery um, for teacher materials, you should have a curriculum-based assessment and fluency teacher handbook for you. And in that handbook will have the directions to give the curriculum-based assessments, the answer keys, and your students should have a student assessment book, and they come in packages of 15. On the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a student example from a kindergarten curriculum-based assessment. And then you'll see one on the right-hand side from an upper level that's much longer and it's a multiple choice. These are another way to monitor students' progress, making sure they're at mastery, because these assessments test multiple skills, and we're really checking to make sure that students are at mastery, not just for that day, but for longer periods of time. What's also important about the mastery test or the curriculum-based assessments are remedies. Both assessments actually provide remedies. You'll find remedies in three different locations. You'll find it in your presentation book, your curriculum-based assessment and fluency teacher handbook, and you'll also find it in the data management system to inform that we discuss on the first webinar in this series. The remedies are important because if for some reason the student's not at mastery, the remedies provide you information on what you could do for the student. Let's take a look to see what they look like in the presentation book. This is an example of a mastery test, and right next to it you'll see the remedies. The remedies give you information on if the student was not successful. It'll tell you what you can do for the student. It's great because it'll refer you back to lessons that you've been working with, and you'll review those lessons. You'll firm up, repeat until firm, until they're good, and then you can retest. These remedies also provide you opportunities to skip lessons. So in this example, if students were successful on this test, as well as Mastery Test 13, it allows me to skip a couple lessons, so realizing that my students are really firm on the skills on those lessons. So it really is great information, the remedy tables. If you haven't given a Mastery Test or a Curriculum-Based Assessment Test, look for these remedy tables. It's a great way to make sure that you're hitting every student and ensuring mastery for all. You also will find remedy uh, firming tables in the upper grades. These are great because it allows you to see where the actual skill was introduced. It will tell you item by item where you can go back to find that skill introduced, again, providing very prescriptive remedies for students who may not have been successful on a mastery test. So these are also located in your teacher's uh, presentation book. And if you want some more further dis um, description of them, go ahead and refer to your teacher's guide. You'll find a, um, a good information on how to use these firming tables. The curriculum-based assessments also provide um, remedial exercises or remedies. They will be right in your curriculum-based assessment and fluency teacher handbook. They'll give you remedies on how to firm up skills students may be weak on on those curriculum-based assessments. Remember in the uh, grades K through 3, they're every 20 lessons, and then 4 and 5, they're every 10 lessons. So you may see these exercises um, referenced on what to go back to. Students will use their assessment books for these assessments. 
but you also may see remedies that are a little bit more in detail. So you may see remedies that will give you additional exercises to actual teach. You're looking at a page from the actual handbook from the curriculum-based assessment and fluency teacher handbook. This tells me I need to teach these exercises again because I need to firm up these skills. It may ask for my students to do certain things. You have pages in the student assessment book for these remedial exercises. So it's real important to go ahead and take a look at the curriculum-based assessments. I think we have one more poll we'd like to um, ask you guys, and it's about curriculum-based assessments. I'm curious to see how many are using this resource. Great. So the question is, have you administered a curriculum-based assessment yet this year? Yes or no? So let's check it out. The majority of the group says yes, about 56%. So we're a little about half and half, yes and no. Excellent. So if you are not uh, using a curriculum-based assessment, look in your teacher resources that when you first received your materials, and you should see in handbook. Um, it's really crucial to have these curriculum-based assessments, so that way you'll have additional assessments to see if students are at mastery. So I encourage you to find those uh, handbooks, and for those that are using it, fantastic. I hope you're using those rem uh, remedial exercises to firm up any skills students may be weak on. Finally, one of my favorite things about to inform is that the remedies are pretty much instant. So when I input my data for whether it's a mastery test or a curriculum-based assessment or even fluency, I can immediately see um, a chart, a graph, and really find information very quickly. So I don't have to do the math about 25% of my students failed or 75% passed. It is done for me on to inform. Here you're looking at an example um, of a mastery test where I actually had individual remedies. So I only had two students who needed some individual remedies, and to inform lets me know exactly who those students are and where to go to. On this test, though, it tells me that I needed group remedies. So no individual remedies required. I just need to take my entire group, firm up those lessons six and seven before I retest. But it also tells me if I need both group and individual remedies, which is very convenient because it allows me in an instant to sort of um, set up how I'm going to make sure that all my students get their remedies before I retest um, them, um, so that way it's really easy the to inform to get those remedies on quickly in an instant. But once you input the data, you have it for you. So making sure we're monitoring that student's progress on the mastery test and curriculum-based assessment. But also, we are tracking progress for fluency. You'll have these fluency accuracy check data collection sheets that you'll have in your handbook, and you can um, use them in pencil paper. As you can see here on the screen, you tell how much time they read, how many errors. It gives you what the benchmark is. That's one way to keep track of progress for fluency. But with, to inform, as soon as you put in their fluency score, you get this wonderful graph and uh, seeing how students are progressing with their fluency. It's a great visual instantly to see how my students are performing either by group or by individual. So I love to inform because it does make it easy to see how my students are progressing. It makes me manage their progress a little bit easier. So just a quick review before we um, stop for questions is that Reading Mastery is a program that's designed to make sure every student is successful. And ensuring mastery is really um, easy to do just by following some of the things we've discussed this um, evening and afternoon. Make sure that your group response is on signal and academically correct. 70% of the group is firm if it's a new skill, 90% on skills that are previously taught, and then by the end of lesson, I want 100% of my students responding on signal and academically correct. Making sure that I'm um, repeating until firm on the individual task or exercises, making sure that I go back and repeat the correct exercise or task on those bracketed um, exercises. It's really important that we are firm so that we students have an opportunity to be uh, successful. Provide individual turns of 25% of my group, making sure I'm posing the question first and my student last, and making sure I'm always tracking progress on a day-to-day -day basis and also on those mastery tests curriculum-based assessments, and fluency checkouts, and providing any remedies that's necessary, whether it's for an individual or for a group. We're going to stop here. I think we have a minute or two for a, a questions. Yeah, great. If you haven't typed in a question yet, feel free to use a question box where you answered where you're from and who you're hanging out with. Um, we do have a few here. It looks like uh, Alyssa, Lisa has a question. 
Um, she does have the handbook, but is looking for the student assessments books. How do we get those? Um, you can go to meheonline.com and search for Reading Mastery. Um, Elisa, I will also send you the link for those pieces. I'm not sure what grade levels you're teaching. So you can order them online, or um, you can also use the links that I'll provide to you. And also, how can I make graphs like the one you just showed for my students? Is there a website? Um, we will follow up with you on that one also. And there are a few more questions coming in. Uh, Chad is asking, what is the cost of to inform? Chad, it's about uh, $60 a year for, for one teacher. Again, it's just a teacher um, access, and we will go ahead and share that information with you as well. A few folks love the graph, uh, Kia. They want to they wanna share that. Oh, great. A few other here. Um, so Janet is asking, I have a student who consistently does not answer on signal with the group. He seems to process slower. And um, any suggestions? One of the things I would love to know is, did he was that the correct uh, the placement that he placed into that group? Um, also, you may have to um, slow your pace a little bit so that he can participate because if it's too fast for him, then he ha is not having the opportunity to participate in the class. I would love it if we could get a little bit more information so we can give you maybe some more suggestions. Um, but the first thing I'm thinking of is is you place properly um, and then talking about your pacing of your cl uh, class. So if you could. Um, if we could respond to you as well um, individually so we can get some more information from you, we would love to make sure uh, to assist you with that student. Yep, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Akilah's asking if to inform is web-based. Yes, yes, it is. It is. Mm -hmm. If you haven't taken a look at to inform, um, uh, maybe we can get out the, um, we have a sample site so you guys could see a little bit about it. We spent some time on it um, in the last webinar in the, in the first series. But it's a really great resource to manage your data very quickly and easily. Um, so we would love to get that information out. So if you have a question about to inform, um, we can make sure you get the information about it. Yeah, we'll definitely share it with you. And we'll also mm -hmm. post the link to the uh, sample, the demo, up on Facebook. So Excellent. That would be you. great. So a few more questions. Okay. Uh, Angie is asking, I have a small group of three, and one of my students consistently holds the others back due to attentional issues. Um, should I keep repeating and making sure they all respond together? Uh, my first question is, is there, do you have any behavior management system set up for your group or that individual that could help him with a, his attention? Um, the, the goal always is to move your group, so trying to assist your students in becoming better group responders is important. So the first thing I might set up is some kind of management so that way um, he could start being a little bit responsible for his attention. Um, the teacher-student game, we talked about that um, last time, which would be a great resource for that student getting him to work as a group. But the goal is to move your group. Um, as close as possible. So, and since you have such a small group, you, you really want to try and keep them together. Okay. Um, we have a few more. Janet is asking, regarding pacing, is there an average number of exercises to complete per session? Uh, she has 30 minutes with each group. Um, well, you know what? Uh, mastery really trumps pacing every time. Um, we really want to teach to mastery, so if you have 30 minutes, my suggestion was to use that 30 minutes to teach to mastery every exercise complete an exercise at the end of the 30 minutes and then finish up where you, uh, the next day where you left off. So there isn't really a recommended amount of exercise to complete. Um, the goal is a lesson a day, but mastery really trumps that every single time. Great. Okay, I don't see any other questions right now, so we will okay. go ahead and wrap up. Um, I just, oh, sorry, Lindsay. Go ahead, Kia. I just want to say that we are on uh, social media and YouTube, but find us on, on Facebook uh, today after the webinar and post a, um, a comment or something you've learned during the session. Share with your friends who are also teaching Reading Mastery and maybe other direct instruction programs. We would love to see your post later today on Facebook. Um, we, we're always excited to hear from customers that are using it, and success stories are also wonderful to hear about. I'll end with a, a quote, to become a master at any skill, it takes the total effort of your heart, mind, and soul working together in tandem by Maurice Young. You guys are doing a fabulous job, and Reading Mastery will make your students 
um, masters at reading. So ensuring mastery with reading mastery is exciting. And thank you so much for all of your hard work. And we'll see you at the next webinar series. Great. Yeah, thanks for attending today, everyone. Uh, in the next 24 hours, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording and to download a copy of the presentation. Um, also, as you exit the webinar, there's a short survey. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback to help us improve and, and plan the future webinars. As Kia mentioned, the next webinar in our series will be on December 3rd, and we will focus on improving comprehension in reading mastery, focusing on uh, story formats. So we hope to see you in December. If, you didn't, if we didn't get your, to your question today, we will follow up individually. And for those that did post, uh, those that we said we would follow up with, we will do those links. We will share those links with you and uh, information about to inform. So thank you all, and have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.